wondering what that is. Okay. Oh, you're boring me. All right. So we talked about the, the, the type, type one and two. The, the method, A, B, C, or D. Then the form, A through F. And that pretty much defines it. But now we can go back and look at pieces of it. So one of the things to consider when you're putting them all together is the sensitivity level. So there are five levels applicable, it's five sensitivity levels. Um, applicable to type one only. What's type one? Fluorescent. Fluorescent. And they are the five sensitivity levels level one, level two, three, four, and five. Those levels are level one, two, three. Level one half, half. Level one, level two, level three, and level four. So this is ultra low. This is low, medium. High. Ultra high. It's like ordering up a cup of coffee at the Starbucks. Therefore, type two. Oh, it's type two? No. 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 Red Do not have a sensitivity level. If they did, it would be close to a one half. If, if you had to sign it in. Now, this is too wordy, but according to ASTM Echo 1417, according to that, Type two penetrants um, shall not be used, not be used. Um, I can't really put in quotes because I'm paraphrasing now. Um, shall not be used for final acceptance. of aerospace products. I probably should kind of break this out a little bit, like this would be point one, maybe point two. So point one, according to ASTM 1417, which is the publication for doing fluorescent, or for doing penetrant inspections, says number one, type two penetrant shall not be used for final acceptance of aerospace products, which means <coughs> not, it's not, it's not it's not parts that you can physically see then. You cannot use it on an aerospace product, which I take to mean an aircraft. <coughs> and point number two, um, type, well, could you, so if type two shall not be used for final acceptance, could you use a type two for preliminary acceptance according to that sentence? Yes. 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 Okay. According to that sentence. Type two, type two penetrants shall not be used for preliminary. Shall not be used prior to type one. on the same surface. So in other words, you cannot use the red visible dye on aerospace products, and you cannot use red dye before you use the fluorescent. Therefore, where would you use the red dye? Never. In class. In class, kind of never. If you know the part's bad and you know it can't go back on the aircraft. You use it, you ruin it forever. That's where I use it. I already know that it's bad. 
I can see the crack. You're I'm just proving. proving it to somebody who doesn't believe me, and it's just a quick way to do it. So. It is there to prove someone stupid. That is exactly it. Right. All right, let's circle all the way back around. That is the basic premise of the whole thing. Remember, don't call them stupid. Ask them. Oh, there you see this. <clears throat> like many things, cleaning is actually like the most important and under rated, understated, excuse me, understated part of anything. If you don't do that right, everything that follows is a disaster. I kind of learned that when I grew up in the body shop world. If you don't clean the car correctly before you paint it, you end up with nothing but fish eyes. So everything's got to be done right. So I'm cleaning the part. I'll just put this because I wrote it. Cleaning can not, actually it can be. Um, To not be understated. And I, and I want to write that because I tend to do that and I gloss right over it because it's boring to talk about cleaning stuff. I want to get right into the meat of the thing and start talking about fluorescent penetrance and doing the work. And, it's, and so I don't want to spend a bunch of time talking about this cleaning because it's, like I said, boring. So, but it's important. Uh, we're going to talk about now uh, cracks or discontinuities, which is a longer word, must be free. Of paint. I could add to that. Oh, I will in the next sentence. Paint uh, and open to surface. <clears throat> if you have paint cracks or areas where the penetrant can get under the paint, where the paint has cracked but the part hasn't, what is it going to look like? Wow. It's going to look like a crack. So you got to get rid of the paint. If the paint <clears throat> bridges over a crack, then you not can see, not see the cracks. You got to get rid of the paint. Sometimes that can be very difficult. Uh, part must be free from recent oils. So no used oil for... I know. <laughs> well, wait a minute. You're wiping it off after the fact so it is free of... <laughs> exactly. So right? it keeps coming back. Any sort of grease, oils, dirt, deposits, anything on there, number one, it, it can hinder your inspections. But the more you do it, the more you realize how important it is. So not only does it mean that you may not be inspecting a, a critical area because there's paint or something on there, um, two, you're contaminating very expensive penetrant if you're using a tank process. Uh, number three, when you get into the booth and you're inspecting this stuff, you see all kinds of things you didn't want to see. Uh, the paint's reflecting back at you. You realize the penetrant didn't go in that area. It's like, no, nah, I'm not inspecting that area. Um, it gives you false indications, poor indications, reflects back at you. It just makes a mess in the room for inspecting. It's so much easier when you have a really nice, clean product, a part, that everything is flowing the way it should flow and looking like it should look so you can feel good about your inspections. You know, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be hard. I can't simulate this for you guys, really. But we're using very small little parts because of uh, the fact that we have to carry our water off here and it gets expensive. And, um, but, you know, if you think about it, you're doing this often to a crankcase that's this big, right? Two halves of it and an accessory case and pistons. And when you're in there looking at this stuff, you, you start to realize that, wait a minute, if I miss something, this could be the death of somebody, I mean, literally. And they're depending on you to find these cracks. And you've got a lot to look at. And you've got a lot of indications going on. And stuff seeping out of, uh, like I said, threads and studs especially. It, it's, you have to time it right. you got to look at it right. You're spending a lot of time looking at these parts. So the better they look, the easier your job is. And the better you feel about the work that you did at the end. And if you had a dirty part, somebody missed a, 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 at a crankcase, you know, a glob of... Um, carbon or something stuck to it, you didn't inspect that. All you did is contaminated the tank and you didn't inspect it. So now you got to start all over again. Then you have to explain that one to the boss. I thought you already did that crankcase. This takes a while to do crankcases. Like, yeah, we didn't clean it right, so I have to start all over again. When you clean it, can you use a sandblaster? Or not sand, the uh, walnut shell blaster? Short answer, yes. I will talk about that. Even if, I, okay, 
Okay. Right, even on machine end mm -hmm. parts, that's fine. All right, free for grease and oils. Uh, cleaning methods. Mm -hmm. We live in California, so our cleaning methods are not the same cleaning methods that the book will tell you to use. Because the number one cleaning method, the go-to that every one of these classes talks about is the vapor degreasing. Thanks, California. Uh, that is the preferred method. But I'm guessing it's illegal in California. All right, so how do you vapor degrease something? First you get a car, or a truck, and you drive to Nevada. <laughs> a vapor degreaser is some cabinet that takes a say caustic solution or a, some sort of a solvent based solution, heats it up to the point that it vaporizes and the vapors raise up, and those vapors degrease everything. So it's pretty nasty stuff. Like an oven clean. Huh? Like your oven clean. Oven clean, yeah. When you do your self-cleaning. Yep. Well. Good thing I can buy some oven clean. That works really good. I've never got to use it. Uh, solvent clean. I'll tell you what I did use, which is funny. Um, so solvent cleaning. Um, what kind of solvent can we use? Water-based. Water-based. <clears throat> Same solvent used to <coughs> wipe. Type C, method C, I should say, not type, method C. Solvent-based remo remover, so it comes in a can, a little aerosol can, and the spot check, or your uh, Magnaflux products, they make a solvent cleaner. It's expensive, so I don't like to use that one, um, but it does. Um, other types of solvent, we can use IPA, that's not a beer, um, isopropyl alcohol. I'm not gonna spell isopropyl or alcohol. Um, well, I don't know if you can get it anymore, but NEK, methyl ethyl ketone. See, it's kind of deadly. I'm still waiting for the commercials to come out. You've been diagnosed with something because you used NEK to build aircraft parts? Contact us. I'll, I will write down that number for me, please. I will need it someday. Astom? Um, yeah, that's good. So you get the idea here? No, what about just gas? Gasoline? Yeah. Either. The reason I'm so hesitant is because it works. So good, I know. Okay. <laughs> the problem is everybody, the, the stance has to be no because it's one fine. spark and you're done. You're yeah. done. Um, but I mean, can you see the same Kind of not 100 low lead because the high quantities of lead in it. Because remember, low lead means compared to what we used to have. So Just 87. Yeah, just getting at the car. I hate the smell of it. Like it just gets in your fingers and it never works. Starting anyway, yes, yeah. gasoline does work. Starting fluid um, ether. Also not What's that? Starting fluid or ether. It gets oh, starting ether. ether. That makes me sleepy. <laughs> oh, and I know it's funny. Average. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, but you know what solvent is. So any one of these solvents kind of works. Um, what I mean is, can you do? Can you do that? Can you? And would it contaminate the part? I don't think. I think it'd be fine. I don't know for a fact they didn't write gasoline. Uh, so you want some sort of residual free, something that doesn't leave a, a residue. Uh, like brake cleaner, I think, is really good for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it's got to be approved, though, too, correct? Or no, Just clean it. Oh, the the uh, uh, kerosene? Uh, would kerosene work? Um, if it degreases it, but that's an oil product. True. So I worry about that one. You don't want an oil product. And you have to consider that it should be something that dries quickly because any solvent that gets into a crack displaces penetrant. So it's important that we don't, that it flashes out and dries quickly. So solvent, what else do I got here? Uh, alkaline. <coughs> I can't even think of an example of what an alkaline clean would be. Put it on the batteries and something. Yeah, you just, just drain your battery out on it. Um, so because we're in California, this one really applies a water um, detergent cleaning. So what does that mean? Well, we have our hot seat washer. 
We also have the parts cleaner in the uh, other corner. By the way, the hot seat washer does take special non-foaming soap. We had a student who didn't know any better, who just <laughs> threw a bunch of car wash soap in there. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 Make sure it's squeaky clean floor. It's actually, actually freaking hilarious because the tool room guy just finished draining it and cleaning it. <laughs> oh, uh, so he said. Alkaline cleaning, uh, simple green is uh, one spot. Oh, that's water. right. Um, okay. CLR. Oh, yeah. I use. Uh, that brings up a good point. Um, so CLR, maybe we need that. Um, something lime rust. Okay. Calcium lime rust. Simple green. I would have to look for it, but your standard simple green, or I was a, a, a big hot seat a guy. I worked with his wife owned the, owns the hot seat dealership, and so. Huh? No, that says his wife's a hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> his wife owns the hot seat dealership. So we had all kinds of hot seat soap. So I've always been a big fan of the hot seat soap. Um, Ripper One was our go-to instead of Simple Green. Um, then there was Ripper Two that would rip the hell out of anything. Um, Do you prefer Simple Green? There is, um, yeah, I liked it a There's lot. There's CPDI. Okay, and now you can get it at any store that, um, it's pink, Pink Power. Pink power? Purple power. Purple, Purple power. power. Oh. Yeah. Is that what it is? Okay. You, use, you use that stuff without gloves, you'll freaking know it. Yeah. yeah. It'll, on your yep, it'll pull the oils right out of your hands. There's and you'll look like some sort of burn, burn victim. Fiber 310 by aircraft Yeah, I take that side. Mm -hmm. What? No. <laughs> Fiber 310? By aircraft screws. <laughs> okay. So what I wanted to mention about Simple Green is that was a big go-to for a lot of uh, aircraft owners because it is a good degreaser. Uh, but, and I want to say it was Beechcraft, came mm -hmm. out with a service bolt and said, stop using that. It's a heavy alkali cleaner that gets between the plates of the aircraft and causes internal corrosion between the, the, the plates. And I, had, and, I, and I knew that, and I hadn't thought much about it. And of course, I'm using a, then, oh, I'll just, well, fine, I'll use the purple power. Yeah, then I went to, and thought about it until I was at, the Rotax school, and they were talking about washing their engines, they said, never use an alkali-based cleaner like Simple Green or Purple, they didn't say Purple Power, I ran home and I'm like, I hadn't thought about that. All these soaps are alkali-based and they're gonna cause corrosion. If the Rotax says don't use it, I bet it's bad for everything. So I went home, grabbed my Purple Power, and it's like, high alkali cleaner. I'm like, okay. But Simple Green does make an aircraft, Simple Green, that is very low alkali. Anyway, it, that's what that makes what the, the electrolysis co uh, corrosion. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, if you have a, something that's completely apart, that's not a problem. If you're cleaning the whole thing, but if you have seams, then the alkali can be a problem. I know the smell of simple green very well. Very easy. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like licorice to me. I go green. Yeah. Uh, okay, water detergent. We have the hot seat washer, and then we have the safety clean. S A F. I forget. Google safety. I, I don't know. It's like with a K. Safety clean, which is a water-based type. So that's fine. Um, steam cleaning. Steam cleaning is not pressure washing. Steam cleaning is literally a <coughs> device that ejects steam water that is over 212 degrees and the steam actually makes the um, stuff kind of explode off the surface at a micro level. So is pressure washing a no-no on some parts? It depends on the part, but it's so hard to pressure wash because you, you know, it's got to be heavy enough you don't blast it down the runway. So <laughs> Get back here! I don't know, I'm just wondering. If I like pressure. I, pressure. I use pressure wash on my I think pressure washers are fantastic because use your hand. Right? So start up your pressure washer and put your hand in, in the thing <laughs> no. and figure out where it starts to hurt. And that's how far away you should be from any painted surface. So like I use a pressure washer to wash my car all the time. If I put my hand right here, it doesn't hurt at all. It's just a fan of water. Right here, I will lose skin. So, yeah, I'm right? paint off cars doing that. Yeah, so keep it, keep it away. Um, <laughs> I worked at Calgary. <laughs> ultrasonic cleaning. <laughs> We have the ultrasonic cleaner set up, um, and then mechanical cleaning. I got mechanical cleaning. What else do I got? Oh yeah, mechanical. Like wire 
wheel kind of thing. I will talk more about mechanical cleaning in the next class. I think I get into great detail on that because we're talking about cleaning engine parts. Um, so use caution with blast media because <coughs> racks can be peened over, which is your sand blasting. So when you say sand blasting, that literally means you're using sand and blasting sand at it. You can actually take on aluminum where you have a crack, and if you blast it, that crack will kind of bend over and seal up the crack. <laughs> I've done it many, many times on cylinders using glass. So that's really bad. You just you covered it up. Now you're not going to get anything. Um, so to do that, we want to use, yeah, I fixed it. Use a soft media at a low pressure. So like walnut shells would be used on So what, what can we say be acceptable? Shell. Acceptable. Uh, baking soda is very, um, baking soda is very soft. I do not like using baking soda because it really does take a special booth. Um, people just put it in regular booths and then you end up eating it. So you can taste it, it gets in your teeth and stuff. It's like that. Um, plastic bead was my go-to. It's a little more expensive than walnut shells, but it's basically a uh, plexiglass ground up in little balls. Can you use the same machine for glass, plastic, or paper? No, you cannot because of cross-contamination. So I had three booths. So I had my four booths. I had one that the rest of the shop would use, leave me alone. And I had mine because they all had to work perfectly all the time. And one had glass, one had plastic, and one had garnet. Garnet, garnet, garnet is, was the most abrasive? Oh, it's horribly abrasive. Yeah, we would just use it as a final hit on valve heads to get knock off some of the hard carbon that wouldn't come off of anything what, else. What is garnet? It's uh, a gem, so. it's a gem, gem of some sort. Holy shit. I'm sure that's also you very. <laughs> uh, a very plastic bead or water. Huh? Walnut shells. Now, plastic and walnut shells are very similar. Um, so unacceptable. <clears throat> Gravel. Unacceptable. Well, definitely sand. It's very, it's way too harsh. Uh, garnet. <laughs> um, and also, I'm going to put in glass here. Now, I know we have glass bead, and I'm, and I'm letting you glass beads, especially steel parts. At one point, glass is really kind of a, a common, uh, everybody was doing it. But I did notice on my own, before they said don't do it, the glass was peening over some cracks. I would say, oh no, we obviously have a crack. You can peen it over, and then I couldn't get an indication out of it. But you could see the crack. Um, it just wasn't deep enough to hold the penetrant. And so that became kind of a bad thing. And then as time progressed, service bolts came out, and glasses said, no, don't stop using glass. Um, it just creates more problems. If you use glass on like a piece of 2024 T3 or something, you'll actually just destroy that piece of metal. It cannot handle the glass. It'll warp it out and do all kinds of nasty stuff. Uh, let's see, avoid wire, for the same reason, we're going to avoid wire wheels um, and scrapers, especially powered scrapers, so we don't want to peen over or create scratches that are going to give us a bad time. And the last thing I have on here, chemical painting. Chemical cleaning is actually a good thing. So that is using an acid, so an acid wash. So um, it is highly recommended to acid etch parts that have been machined or blasted. <coughs> All right, so those are our cleaning methods. Again, I should want to make sure.
thoroughly dry before applying the penetrant. And there's no solvent, water, <laughs> anything in the crack that you're trying to develop because the water, solvent, whatever will displace the penetrant. Can you explain the, the acid etch? Like, like, what is that? Like, how does it work? You'll do it in second semester. It's uh, something we do in the aircraft all the time, acid, acid etch. And so it's, it's not a harsh acid. I've done it without gloves on, it doesn't hurt. Um, over time it will, really right there especially. Um, but you take and you put the acid on the aluminum and it does like this etching kind of a process on it which removes dirt and oils and actually in theory it's supposed to open up small cracks which I have a hard time going on, it's not that powerful an acid but anyway so you do an acid etch and then we usually we follow it up in aircraft with a um, aldehyde conversion but uh, you'll get into that in second year Larry does all that. So. Uh, let's see, so we're going to dry all parts. Oh, that's actually my next point, so dry all parts. <laughs> I actually wrote the same thing. I'm just going to look at my notes. I'm going to dry all parts. I could have made that move. Anyway, uh, so how are we going to dry them? In the heat air metal thing. thing. And our Hand wipe, um, shop air. My notes actually say 25 PSI, but personally, I like it all. <laughs> I'd say that just for like, it's an OSHA thing or something like that. Probably. Use an oven with recirculating hot air at approximate temp of about uh, up to 160. Use an oven with recirc air. That would be your mom's or a convention, uh, convection, convection oven. Um, circulating oven. air um, up to 160 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, 160 degrees centigrade. Because <laughs> you know, what's the what's the hottest you ever want to get aluminum in aviation? What's the safest temp you can get to without causing damage? Boiling. 100 C? 212. 212. 212. That's your safe. Yeah. Um, all right, so then we're going to get into actually doing it. All right, so we've cleaned it, and we know how to clean it, right? Yeah. All right, we have a lot of methods, sometimes, or options. Sometimes that's the worst thing. Too many options. Because the big takeaway is use the right option and make sure that it is thoroughly clean and that you don't have cleaning fluid down in the crack. It will not work. So let's go with a type 2 method C procedure. What is type two? Visible, 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 visible dye. Visible dye. What is uh, method C? Uh, visible. Type one. Or type two is visible. Method C is solvent. Solvent. Solvent removed. And what form though? And we are always, always, always going to use form uh, D. D. Why would we use the form D? An aerosol can. Non aqueous is the most sensitive. So we're using the most sensitive developer because we have the least sensitive, least sensitive, sensitive penetrant. I should change this a little bit. What if that's type two, and then we can do type one. Maybe we could move this into a type one, and then it's more meaningful. Because should we use type two? No, not in aviation. No. So maybe we can move this into kind of back and forth a little bit. Let's see if we can do that. So, but this is same thing. Either it's type one or type two, which would be fluorescent. But it is still 
Method, method C. C. Still method C, solve it removable, and it, we can still do the form D, not aqueous, but sensitive. So we can run through that right there. Uh, okay, so let me see. Let's get through that. What can we use it on? Any forms? Surface. I'm not going to write all this down, but see if you know. What kind of material? Anything that's not quartz. Non Give me some, okay? That's correct. Anything. So what? Copper. Copper, yes. Brass. Yes. Steel. Steel, Steel. yes. Aluminum. Plastic. 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 <laughs> Fired ceramics. Fired ceramics. We got that? Anything that is not quartz. Piece of wood. No. No. A duck. No. A duck. No. <laughs> Sponges. Your hand. Sponge. Uh, carbon fiber would be a non-acceptable. <clears throat> When you have the it's usually impregnated, so what? Well, it's uh, it would the penetrant enough. soak into if it's cured? If it's cured, yeah. Would penetrant be, soak into it? it? Shouldn't. Then it's non porous and then it seems like you can do it. A crack at carbon oh, fire. Yeah. Like you're you're fine. Crack. I know you just rub your fish. You run your hand over it, you'll yeah, know. Yeah, you'll, <laughs> you'll know. <laughs> all day, you'll know. Go through all that shit to fire. God, I had a piece, I had a carbon fiber or something that went to a kite I had, and I ran my hand down and it had slivers in it. Oh, oh, nice. oh nice. Like, like fiberglass. 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 Okay, what's yeah, step one? Clean. Clean. clean it. All right, we know how to clean, right? Yep. What would be the go-to first thing I could just grab to clean it? Solvent. Water. Water. There we go. Mm. This right here is our, that's probably why I was doing it, this is our method Type, type, type two. Type two. Type two. You can't tell by looking at it because it just says SKL SP1 penetrant. This is our visible dye. Well, if it's visible dye, then it's visible dye. So that'd be type two. 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 two but I said it's the same thing for type one. It doesn't matter. So, if you want to do type one? Just take this can out and hide it. And now you're left with developer, your form D, and your cleaner SKCS. So this is cleaner, cleaner, penetrant developer. Do they make a fluorescent aerosol yes. penetrant? Yes, they do. Okay. I have some. All right, so why is there two cans of cleaner and one can of penetrant? You gotta clean it twice. You gotta clean it twice, right? So we could use this, uh, I don't like that they just call it non-destructive testing material now, but uh, we can use this cleaner remover, which it used to be called, cleaner remover to pre-clean. Assuming it's not full of paint or something. What if we got paint on it? Paint. Half painted. Paint got to take the paint off. What do I use to take the paint off? Bonnet shells. Depending on the Scott price. Scott's right sandpaper. Uh, okay, see, now I worry about peening over and covering something. Pressure wash it? Acetone. And so I wouldn't want to do Scotch Bright or sandpaper removing paint. Thinner? I would, acetone? I would probably use a paint stripper. And then a paint stripper, depending on the part. Again, depends on the part. If it's like a crankcase, I'm thinking engines. If I got a big old fat crankcase, then I'm going to take the crankcase, I'm going to put it in the hot seat washer, turn it on, the pressure washer, let it go for 10 minutes. That's going to get all the oil and grease off. Then I'm going to take it out. Then I'm going to fresh water wash it to get any contaminants from the, that particular, because there's oil and stuff in there. Fresh water, wash it, let it dry. Then I'm going to stick it into a, a blast booth. And I'm going to blast it with what? Walnut shells. Walnut or plastic. <laughs> and I will blast all the paint off. Because that stuff blasts the paint off fantastic. It's really good. Big pieces coming out. Blast off the paint. Then I get all the paint off. Then what do I do? Try to wash it again. Because now it's got all the dust and stuff from there. So I'll fresh water, wash it. Let it dry. I'm ready to go. I'm not going to use one of these on it because it's just they're big pieces. And it doesn't make sense. A couple cans. So, yeah, a couple cans. <laughs> no, it's all right. So we're going to clean it. Depends on what it is, how thick it is, but we're going to clean it. But one, of, if it's a small enough part, small enough area, this is the cleaner to go to, assuming it doesn't have um, 
and he paints yourself. I really kind of love that all four cans come in a foam little container kit. Yeah, yeah don't drop it. Um, technically speaking, you uh, do not spray cleaner directly on two parts. I know some of you have been doing this, and I haven't really got on you about that. Unless it is a rough, I'm going to say surface. Right there. It actually says weld, unless it's a rough weld. Why? Because it's just going <laughs> to grab your rag and leave bits of rag everywhere. But you, why would you not want to spray it directly onto the part? It soaks into any kind of cracks. Soaks into the cracks. It's hard to get this stuff out. Look at all my symptoms. Yeah. So, that? oh, that's why you did the white thing. So, spraying uh, floods. Floods the crack. That's bad. Spraying floods the crack. Um, preferably, use a lint free. Lint free cloth, wetted with solvent. Wetted, not soaking. It's dripping out, use too much. Wetted, not soaking. And then follow up with a dry cloth. Follow up with a dry cloth. All right, now what we're gonna do. Apply the penetrant. Uh, see, let me see. Clean it. <coughs> steps, steps, steps. I don't know what the hell I got to do. My timeline's all okay. Allow to dry. We want to make sure that any solvent, water, anything we use is completely and fully dry. What can we do to help it dry? Heat, heat. Mm -hmm. Can heat. We have an oven. You can put it in the oven for a little while. You can use compressed air, blow out the crack, discontinuity, the whole part, get it out. So a lot of dry. Um, let me see. And then we're going to apply the penetrant to the area be well, I'm gonna put to area being checked. To area being Some parts, you're going to inspect everything, every square inch of it. Some, you're just going to check a square inch. Right? If you're using method C, which is solvent removable, you're going to be wiping every little square inch that you put this stuff on. So it's always hilarious when I say this, when we're in the room <laughs> doing it, and I say, OK, you're only going to inspect this part. And there's ways to put it on if somebody just grabs the can and just douses it and just sprays red all over it. I'm like, okay, you're going to be there for an hour or three wiping that part off. So don't do that. So we'll say, don't do that thing. Um, so just to the area being inspected, we're going to apply this penetrant. Because remember, it's method C. You've got to wipe it off. You can't wash it off. All right, so how can we apply it? So you can brush on Uh, we can brush, we can dip, we can spray, we can pour. What else do I have? Brush, dip, spray. I think that's it. I know, I can't think of it. Brush it, dip it, pop it, spray it, pour it. Put the damn stuff on, damn it. Um, yeah, no, it's like, what other ways are there to apply it? What comes next? Put the penetrant on, now what? Dwell, 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 dwell time. time. So we're going to allow penetrant. <coughs> going to let it sit. Ten For how long? Minutes. Ten to thirty minutes. About ten to thirty minutes. Depends on how much patience. That is called what? Well, well time. Time. Well time. Uh, well, uh, what determines if it's 10 or if it's 30? On how long your break is? <laughs> how, how tight the crack is or not. Yeah. So longer times. 
for smaller cracks or colder parts. That still messes with me, how colder parts need more time than hotter parts. We crack, everything comes together. Huh. Cold. Yeah. Shrinkage. Yeah. A shorter time for larger cracks. And also it slows down the movement of molecules, so it will be more as well. Warm parts. Warm it. Throw the part in the glass for the check. Yeah, just run a torch over it. Let's speed this up. Alright, that's a good place to stop. Actually, no good place to stop. I just want to keep going. All day. I had a quick question for you. How did you know to check?